it's disgusting, like the injustice and just the way that people operate and the way that people come with their preconceived notions and stereotypes and things of that nature before they even decide like, I'm gonna get, and they make that decision, like am I gonna give this person my full um, energy and, and my full knowledge and my full, you know, purpose. Hey family, I'm Omari Maynard and you're doing Life with Lakeisha on Living Her Truth. Welcome to the Living Her Truth podcast, where we have honest conversations about what it means to live a purpose-driven life. I am your host, Lakeisha Woodard from LakeishaWoodard.com, the place where women receive the tools necessary to feel seen, heard, and supported while pursuing their purpose. And now every week you'll learn those same tools through candid and transparent conversations. Amari, thank you so much for saying yes to having this conversation with me today. Thank you for having me, Lakeisha. I appreciate it for real. This is going to be awesome. I can't wait. <laughs> it is. It is going to be awesome. It is going to be awesome. I'm super excited about this conversation. And I like to always start off with just talking about how I come to know the person that I'm speaking with. And so this episode is no different. And mm -hmm. um, we have a mutual friend, Anna Bastidas who is the owner or founder of Orderle. And mm -hmm. she put a post up on LinkedIn saying that she was going to do this kickoff party called the Liquid Gold Kickoff Party. And I was like, okay, because you know, Anna is really big into like breastfeeding, you know, because that's what her company is. is mm -hmm. based on. And she was yeah. doing this particular event through, you know, Black Breastfeeding Week. First off, I didn't even know that was a thing. I don't have children yet. Yeah, yeah, me neither. I didn't know either. <laughs> I didn't yeah. Even know. yeah, I didn't even know it was a thing. And so Anna put up the post and she had your, your, your picture in the post. And I'm like, hmm, Black Breastfeeding Week celebration and we have a Black man on the flyer. Let me yeah. read this, let me <laughs> read this post. And so I was like, okay, read a little bit about you and your story because she had like a snippet of your story. And I was like, you know what? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to show up to the kickoff party. And oh my goodness, you painted this beautiful painting, this beautiful painting. And I was just like, oh my God, he's talented. Thank you, when thank I, you. Yes, yes, you're talented. It was, it was beautiful, Amari. It was gorgeous. I appreciate it. Mm -hmm. And her a little bit more about your story. And I was like, oh yeah, I got to have him on the podcast because mm -hmm. I want to get more of your story and then just bring awareness to um, maternal health care and the crisis, especially with yeah. um, Black women. Because like I said, I'm not a mom yet, but it's just so crazy how I've just been coming in contact with all of this information, like just coming at me out of the blue you know, and I'm just like, okay, instead of ignoring it and being like, oh, I'm not a mom yet, so I'm not going to worry about that right now, I'm soaking it in, Omari. I'm soaking it in, you know, because That's I'm awesome. Like, yeah, mm -hmm. I'm like, this is how you prepare, right? This exactly. Is how prepare, Definitely. Right? This is how mm -hmm. I prepare for motherhood. So I want to start the conversation for just, you know, you telling us about you and Shamoni's birthing story. Mm hmm. Uh, so Shimani and I, we met uh, back in 2012. Uh, we actually worked at the same um, not-for-profit organization. She was big. She was just really into kids and, you know, working with children. And I the same. I grew up working with children. I mean, I've been working in some way, shape, or fashion, educating and um, through after-school programs, through you know, teaching through uh, daycare programs for pretty much all my life since I was about 18 years old, mm -hmm. so about 20 years now. And um, yeah, that's how we met. So, you know, we met, you know, awesome. She's an awesome person. We ended up um, seriously dating like in around 2016. And then like shortly after she got pregnant with our first child. Now, um, so the first child that we had in Nari, you know, her, so Shamani and her family, um, her mother specifically is, was already just in the maternal health field. Like her mom was a big advocate. She started out doing social work and then she transitioned to 
creating her own business and organizations. Um, the organization that she has right currently is called Soul Leadership Group. And, um, you know, with that, she has, you know, rice of passage programs. And then she also does just a whole bunch of clinician work within school systems, within, you know, companies, you know, coming in and doing professional developments and things of that nature. You know, so it was always kind of ingrained in Shamani, just in terms of understanding health and specifically black maternal health. And um, so, you know, with that said, you know, she was just well, way more versed and educated than I was within the field. But um, when we were having a NARI, you know, we had a doula, we had a, a midwife, a midwifery service that we used. We had like rotating doulas. So we had like six or seven doulas that we would see on a, like a bi-weekly to maybe monthly basis until she got, um, you know, until she was ready to deliver, which was awesome because it gives you a chance to, when you're at the hospital, it gives the doulas a chance to always kind of be on call, you know, because they would just rotate in and out. So that was cool. But the downfall of that is that, you know, when you come in and you get attached to a certain doula and then you come back and there's somebody different, it's kind of like, you know, it's, it's, it's not the same kind of um, familial type of feeling, you know, community type of feeling that you would want, especially, you know, just in a high anxiety, high, because we were, this is her first child, this is my second child, you know, so she was super excited, also super anxious, you know, just wanted that support. And um, so long, so with that said, you know, when we were in the hospital, um, she had to end up having a C-section with Inari, but, you know, um, it went well. Everything was fine. Well, I should say fine. It, it wasn't fine, <laughs> but she, she was fine in terms of she made it out safe and Inari made it out safe. But there were a whole bunch of issues around, you know, getting the epidural, kind of forcing us to make a decision that, you know, we weren't ready to necessarily make in terms of how long she should wait until, you know, she trying to dilate enough to try to have a natural birth. And then there were issues after um, Anari was, um, you know, was birthed. She was eight pounds when she came out and still ended up in the NICU. For some reason, they said that, you know, her sugar was low and there were just a whole bunch of issues. They said that she had something that was called sundowning, um, where, you know, your eyes were kind of, just kind of be all over the place, you know, but, you know, if you're first being birthed into this world, you know, those kind of, um, you know, those adjustments, you know, your body just hasn't made yet. Plus, you know, she's had this epidural in her system as well. So I'm sure, you know, there were issues around that as well, just in terms of how she was kind of functioning, but she was fine. You know, so she was in the NICU for a couple of days. Um, and, but, you know, all in all, once we got out of the hospital, we were like, yeah, they, we're not coming back to this hospital. And, um, we're going to do this birthing experience differently. So, you know, fast forward two years later, uh, we had Kari September 23rd, 2019. And with Kari, we switched up our birthing, um, we, excuse me, we switched up our midwifery and doula service. Mm -hmm. You know, so we was, the doulas that we had were closer to the house. Um, it was a black organization, a black run organization. Um, and, you know, they were good. It was awesome, you know, in terms of how they kind of structured things out. They had sessions where she would go and have group sessions with other mothers and fathers. Or we would have group sessions, excuse me, with other mothers and fathers. And we'd go to the midwifery service to, you know, just share experiences and, you know, get, um, you know, just get ideas, you know, build community. And then um, we had our doula come to the house. I want to say on like a bi-weekly basis, maybe a monthly basis. And she would do exercises with us, give us information, you know, uh, provide us with, you know, pretty much whatever we, we needed, which was, which was great, you know. But the thing is, is with, and it's unfortunate, there are just so few mm -hmm. Black owned and run midwifery services, just in general. Like, mm -hmm. I want to say, out of all the midwifery services, the midwifery, midwifery and doula industry is ninety-five percent white. You know, even though this is a this is a practice that has been started 
and founded and over thousands of years been run by African Americans, well, Af African Americans, but Africans and African Americans, right? You know, until it got monetized and industrialized it, and now, you know, the tables have turned, you know, so just in Brooklyn alone, I want to say there's two midwifery services um, that are black owned and black run. And um, I want to say, I know there's none in the Bronx. I think there might be one in the city, like, but there is few and far between, you know. So with that said, you know, everybody stretched pretty thin, you know, so that was kind of the trade off, you know, but with all of that, you know, our doula was the best. Our doula Simone, she's amazing. She's still, we still, um, you know, get up and she still contacts me to, to today, you know, just asking about the kids and coming over every once in a while. And, you know, cause it's real community, you know, like we built a really strong bond, a, a relationship and a friendship, you know, through her providing services to the family, you know, so that's, so that's awesome. Um, so the plan was to have Kari at home, you know, because we didn't want to deal with the hospitals anymore. We wanted to have at home birth, you know, so we had everything set up and, you know, her water broke and we were ready, you know, ready to have this baby at the house, you know, so, um, you know, her water broke and then she stopped by dilating though. She wasn't dilating as fast, but not really as fast as much as we thought she should. So we waited and then our midwife told us to wait um till the next day and we just waited as long as we pretty much could until it was like all right you're not she's not dialing enough we need to go to the hospital you know but even while we were in the hospital the plan was still to have a v-back and you know v-back if you don't know is a is a vaginal birth after mm -hmm. cesarean section right so mm -hmm. in terms of having it done shamani was in the range of being able to do it um they say that you know you need to wait two to three two years at least out before you can have a VBAC from your previous birth. And then also you have to be in um, the age range. So she was in both. So, you know, the likelihood of being able to do it was, was you know, it was high. We, we were, you know, we were looking forward to doing it. You know, we're doing the exercises, taking the pills and the medicine, not really the pills, but the natural herbs and pills and stuff that they gave us to take in order to, you know, help the progression of the baby and make and things of that nature. Um, so, you know, we were at the hospital and, you know, we waited and, you know, we waited and the hospital that we went to, they had a high um, rate of natural births. So, you know, we were excited and looking forward to, to that in terms of, you know, making sure that the numbers were on our side and that, therefore understanding that, you know, the doctors and the nurses would be, you know, accepting of, of our wishes in terms of having this vaginal birth. Um, but, you know, after a while, she still wasn't dialing the way they wanted her to. And um, we had to go in for a C-section. So, you know, I was reluctant. Um, she was as well. But, you know, when you are waiting, I, I want to say her, her water broke on the 21st. Excuse me, the evening of the 21st, maybe like early morning 22nd, that we had Kari, you know, the next day, you know, so, um, you know, we waited for a while. When she went in to get the C-section done, though, she was complaining that she had pains in her hand, like it was the blood clot in her hand when they were trying to um, inject the medicine. You know, so that was kind of the first kind of, in hindsight, you know, that's kind of the first warning sign. And then during the C-section, the doctor decided that he also should take out these fibroids that she had. Now, so if you know, um, when you're getting fibroids taken out, that's a separate major surgery, you know? Mm -hmm. So, and to kind of backtrack just a little, um, when they were cutting her open, she had developed a webbing. So webbing is when you have, a, when you have a, any major surgery, but in particular, in this instance, when you have a C-section, and the first time, sometimes the um, tissue fuses together mm -hmm. in a way that looks like web. So it makes it a little bit more difficult to get through the lining in order to get to the uterus, to get to the baby. You know, so with that said, it took them a little bit longer than usual to get to Kari. And then on top of that, you know, um, yeah, on top of that, you know, he decided to take out these fibroids, you know, and at the time we were thinking like, you know, this is great, you know, she doesn't have to 
worry about having them and um you know we get it done one time but you know, like i said it's a whole separate surgery so all of that compounded you know left it open for a long time um but you know kari made it out safely and you know shamani you know she made it back to the to, to the to her to our room and made it out the hospital safely but um you know that was kind of the start of the ending you know um she ended up developing developing blood clots and at the time and again you know it, it it's kind of surreal and it makes it a little bit it stings a lot more for me because like i said you know um you know in terms of understanding maternal health you know we had a better understanding than most because her mother was in the industry and you know we quest so we knew about pulmonary embolisms we knew about you know blood clots forming we knew about the importance of the postpartum period is just as important if even more important than you know the the um the development of the child and then the delivery you know the postpartum is you know that's key you know and um you know she was so the first the with the nari she didn't take any medicine after i don't know how she did it but she didn't take one she didn't take any medicine after she had the c-section and then two she went because she was getting at the time she was getting her bachelor's degree and i want to say may, like literally maybe like a week or two after not even two weeks after she had the baby she was back in, in class like it was crazy because the because one of the teachers that she had was like, yo, like, like, you no, know, these are your problems. Like, like you gotta either come or drop out. You know, she was like, I'm not dropping out, you know. So she toughed it out, you know. Now, <laughs> warrior, I don't know how she did it. She was a warrior though. Um, but for this C-section, you know, it, you know, it's a toll on the body. It's a lot, you know, so it's a toll. And you know, um, the recovery time or the way she was recovering was just a little bit slower and she the pain was more intense and, you know, she needed to take the medicine, you know, so she took the medicine that they prescribed her for the pain. And, you know, she started complaining that she was having shortness of breath. And, you know, we were like, you know, well, maybe it's the medicine, maybe it's, you know, you doing too much because you doing too much, you know, she up and moving around and cleaning the house and wanting to do things and, you know, but, you know, it's, it's, it's say that again. Because, you know, we think we're superwoman. Exactly, exactly. You know, but for all the women that are out there, and of course, you know, not this day and age, especially living in America, it's very hard to do this. But you're supposed to rest for 40 days after childbirth in order to have a full, clear recovery. You're supposed to rest for 40 days, you know. Now, is that, is it feasible? For most people, no, you know, and and in order to do so, you have to, especially now, but even back then, when this was the thing, you need to have the community around you. You know, you need to have people who are coming in, you know, taking care of the day-to-day -day household stuff, watching the other children, if you have other children, taking care of the needs of the baby, other than that are outside of the breastfeeding, you know, piece. Um, you know, making sure that there's food in the house, making sure that the house is clean. You know, you need a village, you need a tribe in order to get these things, these type of things done. You know, so um, that's also something to think about once you do have your child. Just make sure that, you know, you have the community, you have family members who can help if you, and put it out there to them to let them know that this is what it is and this is what you want. If you are, if you have that, you know, capacity to do so. Um, so... You know, like I said, she was complaining about having shortness of breath and, mm -hmm. um, you know, but like I said, you know, was, and then we called the doctor, you know, we called, um, you know, the director at the hospital to tell them what was going on. And, you know, her, her thing was like, you know, maybe you need to just relax and chill out, you know, and, and her and her mother had conversations of maybe you're having a pulmonary embolism, maybe these things are going on, you know, in your body that we don't know, but, you know, ultimately it turned out to be like, you know, just rest, relax, if things get worse, then come in, you know, so now between, so we had Kari on 
September 23rd, and Shamani passed away on October 6th. So this is about a two-week time span. So within that time frame, um, we went back to the hospital for Kari's follow-up visit in order for the hospital to try to push their products in terms of getting us on whatever plan that they have to keep us coming into the hospital so they can keep using her insurance. Um, and then during that time, you know, we did tell them about how Shamani was feeling, but, you know, they're like, you got to do a separate visit for that, you know, et cetera, et cetera. And then we went back another time in order to take um, Shamani's dressing and because the, the, she had to get staples for a C-section so they could take the staples out, you know. And um, that was the following, I want to say that was probably, that was on like the 2nd of October. You know, so um, during that time, you know, same thing. We told them about what was going on. She told them, and, you know, it's all right. If you feel better, if it gets worse, just call us or let us know. But there was nothing done at the time that we were in the hospital. So this is two visits to the hospital after we left, you know, and had to car carry home after he was delivered. Um, and then, like I said, she passed away on, on she went into cardiac arrest on the 5th. And you know, on the fifth, every so let me backtrack a little. On the third, mm -hmm. it was either the third or the fourth, she went downstairs to lock the door of our house. And when she was coming back upstairs, she had sharp chest pains and she was pretty much screaming. She's like, she couldn't make it upstairs. And um, we called the doctor again, and you know, they were like, you know, just relax, you know, take it easy, mm -hmm. kick your feet up, you know, just hopefully, you know, things will get better and then you'll be okay. Um, if things get worse, let us know. And um, at that point, again, hindsight is twenty twenty, of course, and, you know, um, mm -hmm. and, you know, just the reflection of, you know, those last couple of days, I wish, you know, that I was, just like, you know what, let's just go to the hospital, you know, but in my mind, I remember the day, of course, I remember it vividly, I'm thinking like, like, you know, the doctor's not really saying, telling us to, we have to go in, there's a lot of stuff that needs to get done in the house, you know, we got these two kids that we need to take care of, packing them up and getting them to the hospital and getting you there, it's a lot, you know, but of course, in hindsight, it's nothing, you know, it's nothing. It's nothing to go. So with that said, you know, if you are feeling any type of discomfort, unease, you know, and women know their bodies and they know what's going on and they know when they're feeling good and they know when things are not right. And if you just feel like things aren't right, just go to the hospital. Don't call. You can call and let them know you're coming, but go, you know, make sure that you get to the hospital because you just never, 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 never know. You know, and um, so on that day, she called her mom and then her mom reached out to the community and was telling them like, you know, Shamani is, you know, this pregnancy isn't as, this postpartum piece isn't as smooth as it was. So we need the family to come over, or, you know, just help out, help clean up, help. So she doesn't do it. Cause if it's, if it's not done, she's gonna try to do it, you know, so, you know, come over, bring some food, help clean up, just spend time, you know. And, you know, so for the, on October 4th, her best friend came over, um, her mom, who else was over here? I think her sister might have came over as well. And then on the, so, you know, we all chilled out, laughed, joked, ate, you know, had fun. And then the next day on the 5th, her, uh, her god sister came, her mom and her aunt were over here. And, you know, same thing, we laughing, joking, kicking, eating food, you know, just enjoying the company, enjoying the time. And uh, she, uh, she looked at me and was like, yo, I need to go to the hospital. Like my chest is hurt, like I can't take it no more. I gotta, like, I gotta go, like I'm feeling like I gotta go. So I was like, all right, cool, no problem. You know, so especially once she said that, then, you know, I knew it was serious because she, like these last, those last couple of days, you know, she's never really asked to go. Like, we got to go right now. You know, so I, as I'm packing, I'm going to the front to pack up 
you know, overnight bag or whatever, pack up some stuff. And then, you know, her mom and her aunt just start screaming, like screaming my name, like, Omari, come in here, come in, come in. So I go in and, you know, she's in full cardiac arrest. You know, she's, um, um, you know, she's squirming, she's moving. I, I, like it was, it was intense. It was a lot. And you know, we were just trying to bring her back. And then eventually, you know, her mom threw water on and she came back too. And, you know, we called the ambulance and it seemed like the ambulance took forever. I don't know how long. It, it could have been five minutes. It could have been 15 minutes. I don't even know. But it, they came eventually. And, um, you know, their whole thing was, you know, is, was she on drugs? Is she taking drugs? Like, what's going on with her? And we're like, yo, she, her, and her mother is telling them at this point, telling them, look, she's in cardiac arrest. She's having a pulmonary embolism. Yes, baby. Um, let your your eye can make you one, okay, baby. Thank you. And she's um and she's they're telling they're telling them like you know this is what it is. She's telling them that she's you know she's having a pulmonary embolism, and you know they're steady trying to take her pulse and trying to take her vitals and telling her look stop moving around, stop squirming, stop moving, you know. And I'm like yo like she's and at this point you know she's fighting. She's literally fighting for her life. You know she's fighting for her life. And um, he's squirming and moving and squirming and, you know, he's getting frustrated because he can't take the, <laughs> the thing properly. And then, you know, she just stops moving. And then it was like, and I'm holding her at this point. I'm holding her, trying to get her to calm down, trying to get her to relax. And, I, um, you know, she stopped moving and... You know, they do chest compressions on her. They do chest compressions. Um, and then at that point, they called, like, muscle call back up, you know, because a whole nother set of EMT workers came in and then the fire department came. So, I mean, at this point, we literally have about a good 10, 15 people in the house, you know, trying to get her pulse going, trying to get her heart going in. And then each set of people that come and ask us the same questions, you know, like not where vitals are asking her, is she on drugs? Did she take drugs? You can tell us. It's okay. Da da da. And um, it, was just, it was disgusting. It was disgusting. And, you know, and again, I'm not an EMT worker. I don't know what the protocol is, but I'm thinking if you are not getting the things that you need or don't have them here, and you need more support, you need to just get the get her straight to the hospital. So I want to say from the time the first set of EMT workers to when they took her out, it was definitely like 20 minutes, at least, at least 20, maybe 30. It was a long, it was a long time. And um, they were able to get, you know, a small pulse. So they transitioned her to the closest hospital. Now I live in bed you know, bed Brooklyn. And, you know, in bed you know, it's completely gentrified now. Like, you can't get an apartment for cheaper than $2,000 in a one-bedroom. Like, you know, um, there's a whole bunch of coffee shops everywhere, a whole bunch of places to spend your money, and a whole bunch of thriving small businesses as well as big businesses in the area now. But in terms of the infrastructure, of the school system and the hospitals that are in the area, they have not, they haven't um, <laughs> reaped the benefits of this now bustling neighborhood that once was, you know, that once was, you know, bed do or die, you know. So um, the closest hospital, they, 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 the closest hospital to us was in the part, is still and it continues to be in the process of being defunded. So they don't have the same resources as other hospitals um, in, you know, the Brooklyn area. So when we got there, again, they spent, I don't even know, another 30, 45 minutes trying to just diagnose her and would tell her. And it was, I remember one doctor saying like, look, she's having a pulmonary embolism. And at this point there's like 10, uh, there's literally 10, 10 doctors and nurses around her, you know, trying to take vitals, doing this, right? Oh, we got to test for this. We got to test for that. We got it. And she's telling them, look, this is what's happening. This is what we need to do. 
you know, and um, at this point, so with pulmonary embolems, they're just, they're super easy to prevent, honestly. Like if you just get blood thinners, you know, mm -hmm. and then that's it, you know, but at this point, she, you know, she's been in full cardiac arrest. She's coded at this point, maybe five or six times. And if you don't know what code, coding means, coding is when, you know, your heart stops and it starts again and stops. So when it stops, it's, it's coded. Um, so she's coded about five or six times. And um, they're giving her blood thinners, you know, but at this point, you know, the clot has already done its damage, you know. And they didn't have, like I said, this, this, the hospital that we went to, they, they didn't, it's known to, you go in there, you're not coming out, right? Because they don't have, they don't have the infrastructure, they don't have the resources, they don't have the unit, they don't have the personnel, you know? So, um, and it was same thing in this case, they didn't have the tools or the unit in order to like physically take out the blood clot. So what in, had to happen was that she had to have a strong enough pulse as well as a strong enough heartbeat um, in order for them to transition her to a different hospital that had you know, the proper, the proper unit. Mm -hmm. And unfortunately that didn't happen, you know, so they, um, she stayed in the hospital for about 14 hours before they, you know, before they determined her deceased. Um, wow. And it was, of course, you know, like it goes without saying, that's a day that I'll never forget, but. Um, Absolutely. Uh, it goes to just show you like there's just so many things that we have to deal with as you know black and brown and indigenous people that um that is just it's it's disgusting like the injustice and just the way that people operate and the way that people come with their preconceived notions and stereotypes mm -hmm. and things of that nature before they even decide like I'm gonna get and they make that decision like am I gonna give this person my full um energy and, and my full knowledge and my full you know purpose for doing what I'm doing as a you know as a clinician as a someone or as an EMT worker as somebody who is paid and schools in order to do the do, do the work or am I just going to you know be upset or just act like uh this isn't uh do you just already know what the what what the outcome or, or what's going on without really understanding who these people are like you just know she's on drugs right you just know that you know she's probably not gonna make or you just know she's probably not in that much pain so she could you know hold off or you know or you just know that she doesn't have the proper insurance so let me not go as hard as i need to like you know so um you know that's it's really really it's, that's really really sad because it sounds yeah. like you know her life could have definitely been saved you know definitely uh, definitely a week before that that traumatic day and i hate that you had to to go through that because it's, it's taking everything in me just not to get like super emotional just to sit here and to to listen you know to your to your your story, you know, and Shamani's, you know, story, because you're right, there were so, so many injustices just in there. And, you know, mm -hmm. I kept telling the story, I'm sitting here and I'm thinking, I'm like, you know, so you're just going to come in and just assume that she's on drugs? Exactly. Like, why, why does it take 10 fire trucks and ambulances to come, you know, when you could have just immediately just took her to the hospital like mm -hmm. you're right hindsight is hindsight is always it's always 2020 but that is just uh that's just a horrible horrible experience and you talk about so much that i'm you know learning like i'm learning because again i'm not a mom yet but just listening to the story is just making me more aware and it's teaching me because i my, i have i have girlfriends that have kids I have sisters with, with children like we don't have these type of conversations you know and yeah. how you 
talked about the fact that um, they wanted to rush her because she wasn't dilating fast enough. Because I've even heard how, you know, doctors tend to schedule C-sections, just automatically schedule women for C-sections according to their schedule, not even giving them the option to have exactly. a natural exactly. birth, which is, yeah. which is so horrible. Now, I, I can completely understand that what you've gone through, you know, is a main reason of why you become an advocate for maternal health crisis. But you didn't have to though, mm -hmm. you know, you don't have to do this, but what, what made you say, I'm gonna become an advocate and I'm gonna make sure that, you know, Shamani's story is her and other women doesn't have to go through what she went through. Mm -hmm. Like what was, what made you um, to be an advocate? I I think I think the the biggest thing was for me is just the impact of Shamani and just the impact that she had on on my life. Like, mm -hmm. um, so relationships are tough, you know. And our relationship wasn't perfect. <laughs> like I I can tell you that it wasn't perfect, mm -hmm. you know. But the thing about Shamani and me and our relationship is that we both knew that we were flawed and we were both working on being the best partners that we can be for each other you know so you know with that said um you know again even that's hard you know because like you really gotta be like you know like I'll, this is what i suck at it this is what i'm not good you like you really gotta be vulnerable and let you know and and, and honest you know like because nobody's perfect you know but in terms of relationship, people try to act like it's somebody else's fault or they didn't do this right and this is why I'm acting like that. And, you know, of course we had those moments as well, but, you know, um, she was just really big on making sure that, you know, we put systems in place to hold each other accountable and to really build this, you know, a family, you know. So, um, you know, we would go to therapy all the time. You know, we started our, our business together called Art for Living in 2017. You know, and at the time was really kind of based around like doing like paint parties and events and um, art installations, things of that nature for the community. You know, but even with that, like starting a business with somebody and tying, you know, the business, the business funds and, and just the business experience in terms of this is the idea that I have, this is the idea that she has, I don't want to do this. But because she's my business partner, we're gonna do it like that. And, and you know, she's my, you know, my my partner. So I got I better do it, you know. But like it, it was different compromises. So there were different things that we would do business wise. Like even if we were not feeling each other in terms of the relationship, we still had to come together to do certain things in, in partnership, you know. And with that, like it just built a much stronger bond between us. Because um, you know, um, you know, those things transition. Like we may not be talking to each other, but we just made two stacks, you know, so we happy, you know, and we you know we're gonna celebrate. And then, you know, those things turn into like, you know, you gotta do stuff with your partner, you gotta create with your partner, you gotta, you know, you gotta step out on a limb and you gotta take those L's. Sometimes we, you know, maybe made twenty dollars off an event and put a hundred and change in it, and it sucked, you know, but we learned these things together and you know we transitioned and built on these things with each other you know so that was just small one small part of it but i just say all of that to say that you know i was connected to her in a way that i was never connected to anybody else before you know so um you know with that said you know before like right before she passed it was like i was really kind of feeling like all right we're getting to a point where um we can really kind of build and grow and do this family thing and really kind of be there for each other you know like like no take all the superficial stuff out and like let's really do this you know we really gonna do this and then unfortunately you know um it didn't happen like that you know so i think that that's a huge part so for me like i feel a part of me feels like you know, I, I still, because we still have a plan. We made this plan, right? We made this pact and, you know, it still needs to be fulfilled. She's not here, but I still got to, I got to, I got to fulfill it, you know? So the business, you need me something, right? Okay, it's okay. <laughs> 
sorry. <laughs> um, and um, so, like I said, you know, so the plan still needs to be fulfilled, you know, so, and, you know, we still communicate, we still are in conjunction, you know, but it's just on a different level, you know, and I can't do this by myself, you know, and I, I can't say like, all right, she's not here. So, you know, it's over, you know, because that's not the case, you know. So, you know, the business is still running. It's transitioned a little bit and I've taken it in different ways, but, um, you know, she's still here advocating just alongside me, you know? Um, so, like, I, I feel like there was, there was never in my mind that, you know, I didn't have to. Um, it wasn't really in my mind that I had to. It was just, I'm doing, you know, I'm just doing it. I'm doing it and I'm going and, I'm on the ride, you know, I'm, I'm here, like, this is it, you know, because this is what it's supposed to be, you know. Um, so that's why I'm, I'm in it. And then also, too, after she passed, like, our community is just, I'm just so blessed to be able to know the people I know and, and be connected with her family and the people that her family knows because, you know, like, I was just supported in such a way that, you know, it was the best possible way somebody could be supported in the worst possible type of situation, you know? Mm -hmm. And I know, like, I know, like, without a shadow of a doubt that I'm lucky. And I also know without a shadow of a doubt that other people are just, they don't have that infrastructure, you know? They don't have those circles. They don't have that community.